First of all, I can't tell you how much it meant to me to read the thoughts so many of you sent my way after my first posting, messages from my dear friends from the past, and those of you I have yet to meet, and even many musicians who don't play the flute. I also loved hearing from my precious teacher colleagues. You are always an inspiration to me. Before I speak to you about my lessons on becoming a better student, I want to share a favorite quote and a guiding principle of my life. This was said by Albert Einstein. The measure of intelligence is the ability to change. I want to express my admiration again to all the students and teachers who are adapting and adjusting so brilliantly and with such creativity to these new times. The lessons and classes and performances that are taking place online every day are a tribute to your collective love of music and caring for each other. I am so proud to be a part of this community of musicians worldwide. All of my words to help you become more adept at teaching yourselves are designed simply to make you better musicians. They are among the most powerful ideas I ever learned and they helped me both when I was studying with a teacher and when I was alone and I didn't have a teacher. After all, in music, we are all lifelong students and lifelong learners. It is an eternal continuum, no matter what our age or circumstance or place in life. At the end of my previous posting, I mentioned that in these unprecedented times, there is an opportunity to make time for new lessons to be learned with positive anticipation. I believe this beyond question. Why? During several periods in my life as a student and a young professional, I found myself isolated musically. I had no teacher and no master classes or ensembles to keep me on track. I had just three or four months with myself and my flute and sometimes my family, that's it. And back then, no internet either. But when I look back on my life as a musician, it is these times that I remember as unique in a good way, times that really challenged and changed me. It was so easy when things went well. Those times passed with very little concentrated thought, contemplation, or even memories. I was happily occupied with just moving ahead in my life and keeping busy. But when occasional obstacles or circumstances blocked my path forward, I found I had to turn inward. I had to be able to confront my situation with clarity, and then I had to figure out how to move forward again. This wasn't easy at first, and believe me, I had a great capacity for feeling sorry for myself at times but I realized that I would have to make fundamental changes in how I approached my work in order to truly become a better flutist and a better musician. And most importantly, what I learned in those difficult days alone were the very things that changed the course of my life and sustained me throughout my career. These memories are very strong and clear in my mind it is a learning process that I hope to be able to pass on to those who may wish to apply my experiences to your own work in today's strange and isolating times. When I did return to a normal life of lessons and activity, I was a very different student and flutist, far better. I have had students ask me, did the tough times ever stop when you felt you'd learned enough the answer is never. New lessons to be learned were always waiting for me just around the corner. In other words, the learning never stops. There are always discoveries you will learn to welcome. At first, it was almost disturbing and distracting to realize I would be working alone. But eventually, with time, I came to feel very empowered and strong and even inspired by this process. It became invigorating and exciting to try to meet a challenge with what was being generated 
by my own thoughts and inspiration, all the while accumulating knowledge about what worked for me and what didn't work. My plans were these. Specifically, the first thing I realized in those early days of self-directed practicing was that there were two disciplines I needed to address with great focus. First, I wanted a higher level of instrumental abilities on the flute in every area, tone, technique, control, articulation, and of course, rhythm and intonation. And when I speak of control, I mean tonal control. And second, I wanted to become a better musician. I wanted my feelings for the music to be more apparent to the listener, for the listener to feel what I felt. The first big change I made was in terms of attitude, and this was such an important shift in mindset. I had to realize I wasn't practicing with a particular performance goal in mind, an upcoming lesson or performance, competition or audition, for example. This was a kind of work that was motivated by the long game. I just wanted to achieve a greater command of all the elements of playing that would enable me to become a flutist at the level of those whose playing I adored. That was the most profound change in my approach during those times of isolation. I must stress at this point that this was not the normal way I practiced for most of my career. I couldn't have sustained this kind of work on a constant basis. But when I did have periods of time that allowed concentrated, accelerated, and high-level learning, it made all the difference when I went back to my normal life. What I learned in those unexpected times of change sustained me through all of my playing years. I remember wondering, when I was still quite young, what made the greatest of all musicians so great? Learning the answer to that question was when I really began the most significant time of improvement and growth as a flutist, and it continued for my entire career. In the simplest terms, I realized that the answer to my question was that all the great players had eventually and fundamentally been able to teach themselves. This is not to say that they didn't have great teachers and mentors and guides throughout their careers. Their wonderful teachers gave them their foundation and early guidance. But all of these great artists became, at some point, simply brilliant at being able to analyze their own instrumental and musical abilities to affect change and improvement and to find that precious pathway to their own unique voice. In my next posting, I will begin to get into specifics on how I learned to begin the process of self-teaching. But for today, it was so important for me to give you some background on how I came to this way of working. I want you to be able to embrace the experience completely. So please give me your patience as I move through this lesson I will try to pass on to you. My thanks always go to Su Kyung Park, Jin Young Choi, and Lorraine Han. Their ability to put this presentation together in such a lovely way is just amazing to me. And to David Carroll, my husband, musical partner, and now the best editor a girl could have, thank you, David. Nothing that I ever write isn't reviewed and made better by his suggestions, except for this very last sentence, which I did all by myself. At the beginning of this posting, I played a recording I did with the great conductor, Sir Andrew Davis, on piano. I wanted to select a piece of music that was lovely and peaceful and contemplative, and this piece, entitled Daisies by Rachmaninoff, seemed perfect for the occasion. How lucky was I to have such a great musician as Andrew Davis as my conductor during my tenure with the Toronto Symphony. You can hear his supreme musicality inside every single note. The entire piece is a mere two minutes. It is here if you wish to hear it all. 
Best wishes to you. Until next time. Good night. Mm-hmm.